will be speaking to us on the theme of whether medication for mind or emotions is an impediment to being physically healthy or even gaining enlightenment. So Dr. Davis. Thank you, Greg. Thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be the opening act for such a stellar group of health care and mental health care professionals. My question is medication an impediment to gaining enlightenment? The answer, well, the answer to all questions depends. <laughs> Doesn't it? It depends upon your perspective, depends upon your point of view. From the point of view of enlightenment, there is no impediment, there is no hindrance. And uh, enlightenment, just simply the sum total of all that there is, the perception of that in, in what appears to be any given moment. The question of enlightenment from the point of view of enlightenment would be like asking the ocean, how are we going to solve the problem of all these individual waves that just keep coming up like this? How can we get them to give up their waviness and get back to some unboundedness? The question doesn't arise for the ocean. Right? Now, from the point of view of the wave, where we sit, and we're looking at it, at it as if an individual way, then the answer, again being relative to our point of view, the answer, the answers would be as varied and as numbered as the number of ways that there were to ask the question in the first place. So, each would be individual, each wavy case would be individual and would have to be addressed individually. We can make a few generalizations, I'm going to make a couple of generalizations. Um, and it's basically just the way I've been approaching this for the last 27 years in practice. And so the first generalization, well, Whenever you invite a doctor to a meeting like this, what you're expecting to get, right, is some authoritative um, information based on the most recent research. No, right, right. Well, and we're at a disadvantage in that we don't have a journal of clinical enlightenment yet. And so, if we did, though, I can tell you what would be in it. But you got to remember what what spurred this whole meeting had to do with a wave of suicides that came through the community recently. And so, with that in mind, if we had that journal, I can tell you that what would be in there is that 100% of the people who studied, 100% of the people who got enlightened did so while occupying a human body. Right? It's a prerequisite for enlightenment, having a human body. So, the number one prime directive is stay in your human body. Okay? That's number one. It's basic. It's just the way it's set up. You've got to show up with a human nervous system, then enlightenment is a possibility. Or even the other part is not enlightened, uh, even just a... Um, Mm -hmm. a healthy life, that's the way it was given to me. Is, is it an impediment to enlightenment or just a healthy life? A healthy life also will require having one, having a human body. Um, so, number one priority, staying in the human body, whatever it takes. Even if it means taking medication in order to be able to do that. Okay? That's the priority. And so, number two, the second generalization has to do with the field of activity. Okay, so we know that 
being in the human body is important, and then what? Action. Action is important. You remember what Krishna says to Arjuna. Established in being, perform action. So, we're all stuck with this. We're all in the field of karma. We have to have action, so what should we do? What should that action be? The second generalization is staying functional. That's the key. Function is the key, and that's how I've always approached this. So what if, what if you didn't have issues to deal with, and all you were doing was preventative measures? Fine, you know. What if you had some issues, and they were amenable to uh, Vedic lifestyle, um, meditation, herbs, diet, and maybe all the symptoms didn't all go away, but they were manageable, and you were able to stay functional? Fine. Okay. What if you had a set of uh, symptoms that were more intense, and you, and it became a problem for you and the people around you, and you weren't able to stay functional. Medication is indicated at that time. Staying functional, staying able to, that the field of action, the field of all your expression, of all your creativity, all of your intelligence, all of your success, enjoying all of your life is in the field of action. And so staying functional becomes the second directive. And so the key is function, staying in your body, and um, staying functional. Now, in, and so, even you, the use of medication. What if you had some symptoms and you used the medication and it was bothering your meditation, you weren't able to transcend as clearly, whatever, but it kept you functional. Okay, now we have a, a case that would have to be dealt with specifically, uh, you know, risk versus benefit. And it's real practical, staying functional, but, you know, maximizing your evolutionary momentum. Those are the cases, and, and medication is not the only thing. We, and so what if it was both? What if you were able to do some Ayurvedic or uh, interventions plus medication? and then maybe wean off the medication. There's all kinds of possibilities. We're open to all of them. That's what we do. Everybody on this panel, that's what we're interested in. And medication, obviously, is not the only intervention. And that's most of what the rest of the tonight's talk will be about. Um, Psycho-therapeutic uh, um, interventions, counseling things, which I happen to believe in very strongly. I've always had it very good success with um, counseling. So, I'm going to pass it off to um, Veronica. And she will tell us about, um, well, she will answer her question. Thank you very much. I neglected to mention that the way we thought best and most efficient to handle uh, the sequence tonight is that each speaker is speaking very briefly, as you just saw, six, seven, eight minutes, and then we'll take all the questions after that. The reason we thought that would be best was that it's likely that uh, any question prompted by any given speaker might be addressed or even answered by subsequent speakers. We wanted to get all of this laid out, and then the floor is open to questions, and the panelists will stay afterwards uh, to address personal questions as well. So, Dr. Bell. enlightenment. That's really why we're all here. You want to make the right decisions. You want to have all of your actions be right for yourself and for your environment, the short and the long run. And you want to be strong and perfectly physically and emotionally healthy. And you want to be more loving and to receive more love. And you are your, on your own individual path towards that enlightenment. Now, we all know that there are difficulties and, tra and, and challenges on all of our paths. And there's a range of obstructions that can occur. 
They can be small little pebbles that we just stumble over, and they can be boulders or mountains that we have to deal with on our way to enlightenment. But Maharaji has told us that once we choose the goal of enlightenment, that all of nature, all of the power and all of the forces, and all of the natural laws converge in your life to fulfill that goal. You have all of the support you need now that you've chosen that goal. And tonight I want to share some Vedic and some allopathic insights on dealing with mental health issues. And I also want to point out, as the first speaker pointed out, that they're synergistic, that you don't have to choose one or the other. From the Vedic perspective, first of all, you have the most powerful technique to deal with any imbalance, and that is transcendence. It deals with the Parag Parag, which is the source of all problems. And research has proven that over and over again. And let's not take it for granted. Do your program regularly, have it checked. That's really the key to any state of perfect health. And secondly, if there are ever any questions about what you should or should not be doing, just quickly review the behavior over science. Keep them in your mind. They'll keep you away from doubt and disappointment and the sensation of, of rejection. And Maharishi has talked about how we can develop our hearts. We know that, that the development of an open, full, loving heart is a prerequisite for develop, for progressing towards the highest states of enlightenment. And he said that whenever you interact with anyone, you should recognize that you're interacting with self. Even if you're having an argument with that person, you're arguing with yourself. And that softens and, per and perfects the relationship. Now, he said that not doing that, thinking that you're dealing with non-self, is actually like eating wood. It's very harsh on the physiology. It's very unhealthy. And Ayurveda teaches us that bliss flows to us through a substance called ojas from the absolute. And ojas flows in channels, or shrotas, and ama blocks those channels. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can in our diet and our, in our activities to decrease ama. Also from Ayurveda, we learn about the doshas. When vata's out of balance, the person tends to blame themselves. When pitta's out of balance, people tend to blame others. When kapha's out of balance, they don't know. They don't even know that it's out of balance. It's <laughs> true. So um, when vata's out of balance, you blame yourself it causes low self-esteem, anxiety, and worry. So you know as well as I do how to pacify Bada. When Pitt is out of balance, you blame others. It causes anger, you tend to be overcritical, controlling, even paranoid. And especially during Pitt season, it's important to focus on pacifying Pitta. And Katha's ignorance can cause a lethargy, a heaviness, fatigue and depression. It's just that simple. Even if, you, even if you've gotten to the point where you need to take medications or you're on counseling, just take care of these basics. From the allopathic point of view, illnesses have a molecular basis. Uh, the allopathic physicians think that molecules cause <clears throat> emotions and that problems with the molecules lead to problematic emotions. And it's thought that the cause is both nature and nurture, both a genetic predisposition and a physical and emotional environment that causes problems that need allopathic intervention. So let's look into this a little more deeply. You know that all of our sensory input is processed First, everything we see, hear, taste, touch, and smell goes through a series of chemical reactions in our physiology before we interpret it, before we give it meaning. And if there's a problem with that processing with the chemicals, we tend to misinterpret what's going on. So, 
If someone stubs their toe, usually they just say, ouch, and move on. But if you have the genetic predisposition, say, for depression, and you've been in a negative environment, and you haven't monitored your thoughts very carefully, and you think very negatively, you stub your toe, that pain causes you to say, ouch, I'm so stupid, I'm so dumb, I can't do anything right, nothing goes right for me, and it's just spirals out of control. So the allopathic therapies are aimed at medications that correct the chemical imbalances and counseling to help you identify the unproductive thoughts and change them and change your reaction to certain situations. One or both have been proven to be very successful treatments. Now I know, believe me, I've had a lot of experience with meditators and trying to convince them to take Western medications. They are loath to do so. Or I should say we are loath to do so. But I just want to remind you of two things. First, gross problems usually need gross interventions. When I was on a book tour for the book about Ayurveda, one of the first interviewers asked me, what herb would you give for a lady who came into your office with a lump in her breast? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, a lump in the breast would require a mammogram, and if it looked malignant, perhaps a biopsy, maybe surgery, maybe even chemotherapy. There are herbs to help prevent problems, but once you have a lump in your breast, you need a gross intervention. The second thing I want to remind you when we think about Western medicines as being toxic or poison is that there's really nothing in the universe that is not self. It's all self. And the Vi just told us this wonderful story about this wise teacher who sent all of his disciples around the universe to try to find something that was not medicinal. And they could not find anything that was not medicinal. Even poisons the right dose at the right time for the right person can be quite therapeutic. And uh, probably the most, uh, the one that comes to mind for me is Coumadin or Warfarin. We know it is rat poison, but it saved lives for people who've had strokes and other problems that have to do with hyperactivity. So it's just as simple as knowing that if you or a friend or a family member need help, get help. Either through a licensed counselor and or a physician. The physician can prescribe medications and the physician also will look for other problems that may be causing some of the symptoms. A lot of the symptoms of anxiety and depression can may be from an over or an underactive thyroid. The fatigue and lethargy may be from anemia. Uh, even hallucinations can be uh, uh, caused by liver imbalances. So it's important that, that you're screened and carefully taken care of to make sure that you have the right diagnosis and something preventable isn't being, I mean something that could be easily treated isn't being overlooked. And in closing, I just want to remind you that you are on the path you are loving, and you are loved. silent anymore. I'm here because I will not be silent anymore. I will not be silent about myself and all the problems that I've had. I had a really bad learning disability growing up and I struggled and I went through enormous pain in school trying to survive. But only you can make yourself a victim. Only you tracks yourself within your own mind. 
Trauma, I say to all my students, is not about what happened. It's about what we create in ourselves, what we do to ourselves again and again and again. And then I had a bad accident years later, and I lost everything. All my money, all my clients, everything, my practice. And instead of getting trapped within myself, in the biology and circumstances that I was going through, I got up again. And it really, what's so important is to get, it's not about how we fall, it's about how we get up again. People who've heard my suicide prevention talk know this theme. It's about not getting trapped over and over again and saying, I'm going to get up and it's going to take time, but I'm going to make things happen. And I'm not going to be silent in this community. And so I, if you haven't heard me screaming my lungs out, then you haven't been listening. Because we have been making a difference here. We have created the Fairfield Mental Health Alliance. Policies are now changing on campus and across the community. Fairfield Cares has done an amazing job. We did a suicide prevention talk and training, which Craig's also going to mention tonight. Further training so we could know what to do. We're not going to stop. Every day we're trying to make a difference. Heck, I'm even doing a radio show. How cool is that? <laughs> Listen in, that crew. So it's not about what happens. It's about what we do with it. And so I say to you, each of you tonight, it's not about what's happening with you, but what you're willing to not be silent about anymore with what's going on with you and what's going on in your community, with your friends, and to stand up to make a difference. So now's the time to start. I want to thank everybody for being here tonight and the magnificent Craig Pearson who has done a phenomenal job. None of this would be happening without Craig. So I think Craig deserves it. So what's the difference between being happy and happiness? It's an interesting kind of distinction we all get lost in. There's moments of just wanting some pleasure, wanting a moment of happiness. But it's not really happiness, it's just being happy for a moment, right? How is that different from a drug addict when we get so attached to needing that, being happy for a moment? So there's a spectrum between mental illness and mental health. Most of us are trapped a little bit somewhere in between. We think about mental illness, about what's not really working in our life. How are we getting trapped? And mental illness is when it starts becoming profound. We're drinking to the point where we're missing school, missing a job, our relationships are falling apart, the depression is so devastating that we can't get up for a couple weeks. Or we're bipolar and we're up and we're down and we're up and we're down. And the downs never quite match up to the ups. When it's that bad, we get help and when you see a friend in that kind of pain, we let them know enough is enough. We're going to start being honest with each other. And mental health is really about putting in play the work that we know we need to do. Our wonderful Ken Daly is here tonight, and he talks about the same big four that I do. Exercise, <coughs> transcendence, diet, sleep. You all know about them. And if we could go into great detail, and again, tonight we're just going to start touching on things. We're going to be doing more lectures, more talks, so we'll go, we could spend an hour just on exercise, an hour just on diet, an hour just on sleep, an hour on every point of how we connect to people. But just kind of get the notion that 
exercise is one tiny example, is about getting 30 minutes of intensity. And if we're really in pain, it really means 30 minutes a day to shift that neurochemistry. And it's also about connecting to ourselves and about getting that we're choosing to take control over our bodies and start taking control over our minds. It's about that choice, that distinction that we're making to take control of our lives. About getting that we're isolating ourselves and we're going to reach out as hard as it is to connect to somebody else and to connect to ourselves. And then there's this middle ground. And maybe we're drinking a little too much or smoking a little something that's not really working for ourselves. And we think that we are kind of deluding ourselves and we're not really missing school or work, but then again, we're not really out functional as much powerfully as we need to be. What's working in our lives? And maybe you have attention deficit disorder and you need the magic pill. Or maybe you need to reach out to somebody who knows a little bit more. Or maybe you just notice your focusing isn't quite there. With a learning disability, there's a distinction between your achievement, which is maybe down here, starts here, but really down here, and your abilities, which are kind of up here. So we've got this kind of gap. Same thing that we have with maybe attention disorder, but it's also the same as if you have like a mild dysthymia, a mild depression, or anxiety, or some other condition, where you have a gap between what your ability really is and what you're achieving. So something's not really working, and giving that you need to move to that next point allowing that to happen, allowing a little bit of those mental health things to fall in play so that you could start taking control again. It's allowing yourself to have that courage when I'm here to get up again, to say I'm going to make a difference. And now's the time to start making that difference. Now is the time to start creating something more. <coughs> so I'm going to ask you guys one moment. And what I'd like you to do is in a room full of meditators, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for just a second. So if you wouldn't mind, just close your eyes for just a second. It's going to be a very short little exercise. I'm going to ask you a question. Think about whatever isn't optimal, whatever's not quite working, whatever that might be in your life. And you wake up tomorrow morning, it's called the miracle question, because that's what happens. A miracle. It's gone. Whatever wasn't there is now departed. You now have that power. You now have that strength. You now have that courage to make that difference. And just look at what your life is without that thing. Things to actually work in your life as you need to be fully. That thing is gone. Now is the question, what's different? From the start in your morning to the end of your day, what have you done with it? What have you created to make your life work this day, now? To encompass this power and take it home with you. And when you open your eyes again, just take a moment and breathe that in, that that's the new you that you're going to start on. Because we don't need to focus on what was, as some people get trapped in here, focusing on the negative, and here's all these terrible things that have happened, and woe is us. We don't need to get lost in what's possible, but what we can actually create. Because now's the time to start making it happen. So take a moment now and get that in your head who you're going to be that new vision of yourself. And tonight, 
I'm going to ask one thing that you say this one thing to one person. One thing to one person. This new you. And in fact, while you're doing that, you might even give them a gift by saying this is the vision of who I see them to be as I see the new vision of who I am to be. Because as you give that random act of kindness to somebody else, you create it within yourself. Allow that to be there now. Thank you so much. Today, suicide is a major public health problem all over the world. In the United States, over 39,000 individuals die by suicide each year. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that more people now die of suicide than in car accidents. What motivates so many individuals to take their own lives? Suicide is a desperate attempt to escape suffering that has become unbearable. But despite their desire for the pain to stop, most suicide individuals are deeply conflicted about ending their lives. They just cannot see any other option. Suicide prevention starts with recognizing the following nine warning signs and taking them seriously. Number one, talking about wanting to die or killing oneself. Sometimes the person writes poems or stories about death. Number two, seeking out lethal means, seeking access to guns, pills, knives, or other objects that could be used. Three, talking about feeling hopeless or having no reason to live. Four, talking about feeling trapped or unbearable pain. Five, talking about being a burden to others. Six, increasing the use of alcohol or drugs as well as impulsive or reckless behavior. Seven, withdrawing from friends and family, increasing social isolation. Eight, giving away money or prized possessions, and nine, and this is very significant, a sudden sense of calm and happiness after being extremely depressed. This can mean that the individual has made a decision to end his or her own life. Suicide risk is greater if the above warning signs are related to a painful event, loss, or change. Risk factors also include depression or bipolar disorder, family of history of suicide, and previous suicide attempts. If you see any of these warning signs in a friend or family member, you may wonder, is it a good idea to say anything? In this kind of situation, it's natural to feel uncomfortable. But anyone who talks about suicide or shows other warning signs may be in crisis and needs immediate help. You must speak up. When you reach out to such people, ask them how they're doing. Your goal is to get them talking for as long as they want. You can help lighten their load if you listen with compassion and a non-judgmental attitude. Do not argue with a suicidal person or lecture on the value of life. Just listen. Let the person unload despair and ventilate anger. No matter how negative the conversation seems, the fact that he or she is willing to talk to you is a positive sign. 
Your honest talk and careful listening will give your friend or family member three critically important messages. One, I take you seriously. Two, I care about you. And three, I want to help. Now, you must ask your friend or family member four direct and important questions. Number one, are you thinking about killing yourself? Number two, when do you plan to do it? Number three, where do you plan to do it? And number four, how do you plan to do it? Many people are surprised to learn that suicidal individuals are amazingly honest about their plans. They are not evasive or dishonest when they are asked direct questions. The answers to the four questions help us evaluate the level of suicide risk. Let us say that the individual says, yes, I am thinking about killing myself, and then he or she expresses a concrete suicide plan with a specific time in the near future and a specific place. He or she also answers the how question, saying that lethal suicide means, such as a gun or pills, are available. Because there is a concrete suicide plan and lethal means are available, a very high suicide risk is indicated. You must take immediate action. Call 911-911 or take the individual to an emergency room. Remove guns, drugs, knives, or other potentially lethal objects from the vicinity. Do not, under any circumstances, Leave a suicidal person alone. Perhaps your friend or family member answers, yes, I am thinking about suicide. However, there is no suicide plan. This would indicate a lower level of imminent suicide risk. In this case, you would intervene by taking the person to a local mental health professional or physician. If you have any questions or doubts about the level of suicide risk of a troubled friend or family member, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Their number is 1-800-273-TALK. Numerically, that's 8255. That's 1-800-273-TALK. You will be connected with a trained responder available 24 hours who will answer your questions and guide you through the intervention process. The responder will also suggest referrals and resources <coughs> for follow-up treatment. Even after the immediate suicidal crisis has passed, do everything in your power to make sure that your friend or family member continues with follow-up treatment. If the doctor prescribes medication, make sure it is taken as directed. Be aware of possible side effects and be sure to notify the physician if the person seems to be getting worse. It often takes time and persistence to find the medication or therapy that is right for a particular person. Stay in touch with the person, periodically checking in or dropping by. Encourage a wellness plan, which includes plenty of sleep, healthy diet, regular exercise, and the TM technique. Your support is vital to ensure that your friend or family member remains on the recovery track. Thank you. Thank you. I really hadn't prepared anything tonight because I was told it was a full plate, but I've been involved in this uh, project for the last uh, few months. Very much, uh, uh, very dear to my heart that we provide our community, particularly our meditators, with 
the tools they need to help their friends and the insight and knowledge they need to see when they themselves may need help. And I just want to acknowledge uh, both uh, uh, Scott Terry and, and Craig for the amazing job they're doing uh, to make resources more available and others in the community as well. So one of my, um, what, something that stands out in my mind as a practitioner of Maharshi Ayurveda, I see mostly meditators in this community and uh, of course I try to use Maharshi Ayurveda treatments as much as possible. In 2006, as the Invincible America course was starting and Maharshi was there at all these meetings, it struck me one time that Maharshi was a great one doctor and secondly that he was a great therapist. <laughs> one day uh, a gentleman got up and told the story of how he was having a lot of sleep problems and he had been to various doctors and he had been diagnosed with sleep apnea and even though he had some machine and he had a lot of instructions on how to deal with this, he was still having a lot of trouble sleeping and that this interfered with his program during the day in the dome and that he spent a lot of time sleeping instead of transcending and he wished he could sleep at night and then transcend in the day. And Maharshi was so patient and the person found of course, this uh, was very distressing to him, being committed to evolving and being on this course and being in the domes. So he, he was obviously really distressed about it and he asked a lot of questions and Maharishi was so patient and he just listened and listened and he asked him questions, have you been to see a doctor and what has the doctor told you to do? And have you followed the instructions of the doctor? And, um, and then he asked for follow-up, and the next day or the next day in the meeting, he asked the gentleman to come up and say how he is doing. And one time, the gentleman said, Well, Maharshi, I only slept five hours last night. I was very tired. And Maharshi said, No, no, no. That's wrong thinking. You should think. I slept five hours last night. And I thought, amazing, Marishi is a therapist. <laughs> He's addressing the mistake of the intellect as it expresses in this person's interpretation of his experience. As Scott so beautifully said, it's not what happens to us. It's what we make of it inside of ourselves. It's not that we have the learning disorder or we lost the money or we lost the job or we had a trauma as a child. It was, what did we make of that? What thinking did we take on? What story did we take on? And ultimately, what do we need a story for? And, and how is that serving us? And when we begin to look and we realize that we are the creator of our own reality, only then, and we look at it really honestly, and, and that often takes like 99.99% of the time, that takes the help of somebody with another perspective, an outside perspective, to hold up the mirror and ask us with all love and all concern and all care and all determination to help us out of our hole that we've dug ourselves into because we're human <laughs> and helps us to see how we have made certain choices of how we think about things. We've chosen to think, I only slept five hours last night instead of, I slept five hours last night. And what a difference a perspective can make. So I just wanted to say that my experience is everybody that comes to see me who's in, been meditating and I feel everybody in this community has tremendous amount of pure consciousness stabilized. In fact, 
If you're not in CC, you're very close to in, being in CC. And maybe it's only a few of these Pragya Prads that we're holding on to. Um, the ultimate Pragya Prad, of course, but maybe some of these other more superficial ones may be getting in the way. And the more powerful we are, there's that analogy, Mara, as you said, if we're, um, you know, if you're just flying as a bird, if you go a few degrees off, well, you can just go a few degrees back on, you can correct that. But if you're a jet plane and you go a few degrees off, maybe you end up in another country or continent. Or, and if you're a spaceship, you know, you may end up in another solar system. So the faster you're going in your evolution, the more, if you're off a bit, that can really be a problem. And I, I see in patients who come to me who maybe have persistent health problems, often I found in the pulse, there's a sadhaka pitta. There's something emotional at the basis. And it's something stuck, some kind of emotional stress or story or something that is needs some <coughs> resolution or some, some moving out of the system. And with our powerful consciousness, if we focus on the, the only five hours we got, then it becomes bigger and bigger. So I would just encourage everyone to, uh, if it's as simple as maybe a bad mood sometimes, or it's as simple as I feel stuck in my life, or something just didn't go right for me, or something happened to me and I feel like I'm not fully myself because of it. It could be, see a very good therapist, somebody who can help you to see that and to correct that, the light of consciousness on it from another person and your own shining back with their help can dispel all of these uh, misconceptions or proper thoughts and help you to, as Veronica said, just purify those last stresses in the heart and, and begin to enjoy that full bliss that is your full uh, birthright. So thank you for those, your attention. Thank you very much. Just speak, you speak as long as you want. Mm -hmm. Five minutes. Mm -hmm. So I had to write it down. So you're probably going to hear me reading it a bit. But it's very well written. Five minutes. <laughs> All right. Marshi University of Management. This is his place. This is Marshi's place. And this is the greatest lighthouse of his teaching and his legacy in the entire world. <laughs> Um, Marshi told many of the leaders of our movement, and many of you heard him say it, that every lesson in MUN is reflects upon total knowledge. It has total knowledge in it. And what we're doing here today is, is kind of, well, not today, but ongoing, is kind of unique. We're, we're, we're bringing in psychotherapy as modern techniques of dealing with emotional, psychological problems. We, haven't, we don't have a lot of history with it except that we know that in, in, the way we're going to do it here has to be in keeping with that mandate of total knowledge. It has to be Vedic knowledge. It has to be based on Vedic knowledge. Dr. Nancy was talking about Marsh. He's a great therapist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was. He, he was... Anyone who's ever been around him knew that he could see exactly what you needed to hear. He would tell you in, in over a period of days or in a moment. It was, it was marvelous. So, so this is what we need to do here at NU. But you may be wondering, why are we doing this now? Why haven't we done it sooner? The problem is that there's a lot of good things in modern psychotherapy, but there's a lot of stuff not so good for us. And that's what we have to sort through because now we're going to do it formally. Dr. Shapiro has been doing it for almost 30 years. 
He has seen thousands of people here on staff and, and, and students. He's done a wonderful job, and Dr. Gerbero knows what Marshi would like in psychotherapy and what he would not like in psychotherapy. So he's our, our great resource. He's probably done psychotherapy with more meditators than anybody else in the world. Right? So, so we have good resources. <laughs> we have that resource. We have all of us who've heard Marshi's teaching. But that's what we have to do. We have to stay on, on task. Um, th th there's just a lot of things in the field that aren't good for us on the path of Marshi's yoga. Okay, so some of you may know that I've been a clinical psychologist for a long time, 20 years or more. I worked in prisons, locked psychiatric wards, nursing homes. I've worked in private practice. I've done psychological evaluations and all these tests, you know, like the Rorschach and all that stuff. Um, I've seen families, individuals, I've seen virtually everything in the book in terms of psychopathology. So I know this stuff, right? Well, it depends on who you ask. So I'm going to tell you a funny story. Um, I was a TM teacher long before I was a psychologist, and I've always kind of honed my skills based on Marcy's knowledge. Uh, in fact, I, I became a, I, I took the PhD so that I could teach people to meditate and take third-party payments, because as a doctor you can get the insurance to pay for it. It was basically a scheme to just keep teaching TM. <laughs> but I learned some stuff along the way. So one of the times when I was talking to Marishi about psychology, psychotherapy and all this, I was really enthusiastic about something in the Veda, and I was trying to draw him into, you don't draw Marishi or anything, I was trying to draw him into a, a, a kind of a treatment plan, this kind of stuff. Out of the blue he goes, but you're an amateur. <laughs> so it depends on who you ask. <laughs> you're an amateur. But what I said, you know, I was like, there's Marishi. What do you say to somebody at that statue when they say you're an amateur. Yes, Marshi. You're an amateur. And it took me a while. I was, I used, it's common for me to not be able to figure things out right away. So I, I thought about it, and I realized he wasn't trying to shame me. He wasn't trying to dismiss me. I realized that what we were talking about was way outside the box. It was something that would not meet common acclaim, would not be accepted in the paradigm of psychotherapy, in the paradigm of modern psychology. And it needed to be brought forth within the rubric of an entire model of psychotherapy that is static. It's very different, it's very different. Um, Marshi once said that, that psychology was the queen of sciences. He loved psychology, this was in the early days. And he, until he found out that you can give scientific evidence to scientists, and if it's outside the box of their own issue, their own desire for prestige, their own desire for status in the, in the, in the field, and making a name for themselves, they won't hear it. So, the, the, the reason why she likes psychology was because the language of psychology fits hand in glove with the Veda and the, and the knowledge of yoga. All of these concepts. It, it, you, can find, you can find complete knowledge, you can find uh, complete knowledge in all the great religious traditions, but, but it's, 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 it's buried in metaphor, it's buried in cultural and social mores that have been long forgotten. But the Veda is a scientific discussion, the Veda is a scientific work. It, it is completely rigorous and understandable. For example, there are at least two words in Sanskrit in the yoga literature for the word ego, right? Science, psychology, ego, ego right? One is asmita, which is often translated as individuality. The other is ahankaras, which is literally translated as the making of who I am. And in modern psychology, we would say that's like self-image or self-esteem. It's slightly different, slightly different from the Vedic perspective. Um, there's two words for, for intellect. One is buddhi, which is the finest intellect, where the sum total of experiences are, are decided upon in terms of what's good for me, what's bad for me, what's positive, what's negative, it's buddhi. And there's the other, um, pratya, 
as you said, Paragya Parad. It's the it's the mistake of the intellect that's about what you think, what you believe, what you what you understand, your reasoning, that sort of thing. So so the, the language of the Veda is, is brilliant language of psychology, a very complete language of psychology. You could write volumes about any one of these concepts and volumes have been written. It's called the Vedic literature. Um, it's a perfect science of psychology. We just have to bring it to light now here at NUM. And again, we want to be very cautious when we do that so that we can, we can, you know, make it something that Maharishi would be proud of, something he'd want us to do. So the point here today is that there's a whole lot, and I don't want to, I don't want to discredit it. There's a whole lot in modern psychotherapy that's extremely valuable. How do people not come up with the truth when they seek a compassionate cure for the suffering of human beings? Psychology is nothing if it's not the science of compassion. That's what we do. That's what we want to do. Now people get it all off on this, that, and the other tricky thing and that idea and that idea how to do it. But at the end of the day, it's all about trying to help someone out of what's causing them to suffer. So, the, the, the thing is that the, the biggest gift of compassion, the biggest psychotherapeutic gift of compassion is Maishi's TM, Transcendental Meditation and its Advanced Techniques. There's no greater healer. That's it. And, and, and if we need, and we should, again, not be shy, not be embarrassed. No one has a a lock on mental health. We're all subject to times of weakness, times of suffering, times of confusion, times of sadness, times of fear. You know, if we if we need to see somebody, we should see somebody. But we shouldn't forget our program, because that's the basis of it all. We shouldn't feel like our, our program failed us. Because cycles come, things come and go. You have to have help sometimes, and that's okay. But see somebody who knows what you're doing, you know, see, there's many wonderful compassionate practitioners out there, see somebody who knows that you're practicing TM and think that's a good thing. And if, you know, you, 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 you need to be in collaboration with, a, with your health service providers and a, and a qualified teacher of TM, that's a good idea too. Bring them into the milieu of your treatment. You deserve, you can, you should control your treatment process and you should, you deserve the best and the best really begins with TM. So, um, what does, uh, just briefly, what does the, the, the Vedic literature say that psychologists should actually do? <coughs> Though that's huge, that's the subject of the thing, huh? In the Charaka Samhita, one of the, the great texts of Ayurveda, it says that the the doctor heals in three ways. First and foremost is the spiritual therapy, and that's mantras, yagyas. That's our program. That's what we. That's what we. The main emphasis. That's what we do for ourselves, ongoing every day. And the second way that the doctor heals is in the physical therapy. So this is panchakarma, the herbs, all the things that our distinguished physicians are very well versed in. Um, you're pursuing purity of the body, purification of the body. One of the foundations of yoga is purification of the body. And it's a great, a great purpose of life, and you need to pursue it. And, and like, it's so important, you know, I think Nancy was saying, or someone was saying, one of the doctors was saying, if, if someone has a problem emotionally, psychologically, there could be something really physical that could make it go away, a little vitamin deficiency. And there's literature on schizophrenia being cured by introducing vitamins and minerals, it works. So, I mean, this is an important aspect. Huh? But the last aspect, the third thing that the doctor should do, according to Chark, is the psychological therapies. So it's there, see? And in, in a nutshell, it says that the psychological therapy is, quote, the removal of the mind from harmful objects. <laughs> the removal of the mind from harmful objects. It, it, it's, 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 it's beautiful. So, so what I want to do just in a second, we don't have time to go into it too deeply, but I just want to give you a little bit of a, uh, a taste, an insight into what we would call the Vedic treatment model. You know, all psychologists are like, I'm a Freudian, I do the treatment. No, we don't do that, but, but 
everybody has a treatment model or a treatment philosophy, huh? For Vedic counseling. The Vedic psychologist begins by working within the framework of the activities of the mind. According to the, uh, again, the Yoga Sutras of Maharishi Patanjali, all the activities of the mind, all the objects of the mind, fall under four headings. So now think about this. There's four things. Valid knowledge, invalid knowledge, imagination, deep sleep, and memory. I'll let you ponder that at home. But if you, if you think of any psychological <coughs> disturbance, any kind of psychological disorder, it, you will find that it is found in the context of those five things, either singular or in combination. Um, this is a very paradigm. It's, it's different. It's very different than the way most modern psychologists think. Um, the ultimate goal of, of Vedic counseling, Vedic psychology, isn't, you know, like Freud said, love and work, settle for that. No, the ultimate goal is, is, is enlightenment. It's, it's, it's having a, 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 someone to talk to who knows how to nurture the delicate and the supreme path that you're on. And at the same time, deal with them. what's going on. And, and it's, 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 it should be possible. And that's what we want to, that's what we want to culture here. That's what we want to formulate. So we're, we're, we're going to have counseling at, at, at Jim's clinic. Jim's going to be the, the, the chief proprietor of the clinic on campus. And all the practitioners coming and working will be working under this rubric of a Vedic model. Easy for the physicians. They've been doing all the data. Vedic counseling, Jonathan and I have got to figure some details out about that. <laughs> but well, let me just give you a little... A little technique. So, was it Dr. Veronica, you said about uh, the, the uh, behavior over silence. You mentioned that. This is like that. It's the behavior over silence. It, it, this is, in the, in the, again, from the Yoga Sutras. It's a, it's, a, it's a thinking audit. Any trouble you have that has something to do with the fact that you live in the world with other people, <laughs> If you remember to remember this, and this little thinking audit, when you're ruminating about somebody or some situation, you remember this and you, and you find yourself or that situation in one of these categories, it'll bring peace to your mind, it always will. It's called in the Yoga Sutras, it says to purify the mind. The yogi has friendliness towards the happy, compassion towards the unhappy, takes joy in the righteous, and has equanimity towards the unrighteous. This is the, the path of love, the purity. Jay Good So now is the time when we ask questions. So please. Oh, we have the path. Oh, there's a mic. Where's the mic? Right here. Right here, right here. So please come down to the mic. Test. Okay. You, you pass the test?